Hello everybody and welcome to a new video on the Mio Lessons channel and in this episode we're going to talk about Birds in Flight once more but this time with a different camera and a different system, the OMD M1 Mark III, so micro four thirds and as usual I'm going to show you all the settings to configure in the camera, how the camera performs and at the end of the video you also find the key parade, the score I gave to the camera and how it compares to other mirrorless cams I've tested for Birds in Flight. And if you own an M1 Mark II, an M1X or to some extent an M5 Mark III, well this video is for you as well because all the settings that I'm going to mention in the video are available on the other OMD cameras as well. And as usual you're going to find a written version of this video on our website mirrorlesscomparison.com, links in the cards in the description and down below you can also find the chapters if you wanted to jump to a specific section of this video. Okay, so let's get started and first of all here we have the gear I'm going to talk about today. And so we have the OMD M1 Mark III. This is the teleconverter 1.4 and this is the 300mm f4 Pro lens. And this is a lens I've tested many times with many different cameras. It's very good when it comes to sharpness, uh, AF motor and the optical stabilization is one of the best I ever used on any telephoto lens of this kind. And just to remind you, uh, 300 mm on micro four thirds is the same as 600 mm on full frame when it comes to angle of view. And with the teleconverter, uh, you lose a stop, so instead of f4, it becomes 5.6. But with this lens, you get a 840 mm equivalent, so quite a long reach. Now, let's have a quick look at the camera main specs in case you're not familiar with it. So, we have 20 megapixel four thirds sensor, which is the same as the flagship M1X. Sensitivity is 200 to 25 times 600 ISO. The autofocus is also the same as the M1X, minus a few settings. This camera can be crazy fast when it comes to continuous shooting speeds, and there are important settings to understand, so we're going to talk about this a bit further in the video. We have two card slots, although only one is compatible with UHS-2. The viewfinder is more or less the same as its predecessor, which is a bit disappointing. I was hoping for an upgrade in resolution, but it remains a good EVF nonetheless. And finally, the camera is completely weather sealed against dust, moisture and temperature down to minus 10 degrees Celsius. There are a lot of autofocus settings in the M1 Mark III, so let's begin with the focus points or target modes as Olympus calls them. The M1 Mark III has six target modes. All, where all the 121 points are used, 25 area, 9 area, 5 area, and single arrow with two different sizes. The one that consistently gives me better results is the 25 area mode. All target would make sense because all the F points are active so the camera can track the bird even if it is at the edge of the frame, but the keeper rate drops by 10% or even 15%. The other area modes are just too small, so 25 area is the one to select. You can also create your own custom area, so for example I could make a 7x7 grid which is 49 points rather than having just 25. Or you can create horizontal or vertical lines of points. For example, a horizontal line could be useful when the bird is flying close to the water. However, for a general use, once again, I find the camera to work better with the preset 25 area. Obviously, you want continuous autofocus and there are two modes on the OMD, the normal continuous AF and CAF plus tracking. With the latter, the camera uses one point and once you lock on the subject, it follows it everywhere in the frame. Again, this on paper could be a great setting to use, but it is not reliable enough and it will lose the subject easily, not only when the bird flies against a busy background, but also when the bird is up in the sky. So use continuous AF only. Next, we have a setting called AF plus MF. Basically, it keeps the focus ring on the lens active so that you can fine tune focus manually after engaging autofocus. My advice is to turn that off because you may accidentally turn the ring while holding the camera with the risk of altering the focus distance. It's not a function you're going to need here anyway. Then we have AF scanner with three options where you basically tell the camera what to do if the subject is not clear, or if there isn't enough contrast. Should the camera give up? In that case, choose mode one. Should the camera scan from the minimum focus distance to infinity just one time? In that case, choose mode two. Or should the camera keep scanning back and forth continuously until it finds focus again? If you like the sound of this better, Choose mode 3 and this is the one I use. Even with AF scanner set to mode 3, there might be times where the camera struggles to focus correctly or takes too much time to correct focus. In that case, you can try to stop focusing and then re-engage the autofocus right away to see if that helps the camera 
get that extra kick in speed and lock on the subject successfully. Or if you see that the camera has missed focus completely on the background or foreground, you can stop focus, then recompose just to see if there's something in the middle you can quickly focus on, for example, a tree, and then you go back in following your subject and hopefully the camera will pick up more quickly and lock successfully on the subject. Next, we have CAF sensitivity, which lets you control how quickly the camera should respond in changes regarding the distance of the subject. You want the camera to be as reactive as possible, so choose plus two. Then we have two settings called CAF Center Start and CAF Center Priority. And you can choose which target mode these settings apply to. CAF Center Start tells the camera to begin focusing with the point at the center. For example, if you enable it for the old target mode, the camera will start with the point in the middle, rather than another one out of the 121 points available. This is useful if you know that your subject will be at the center at the beginning of your sequence. So you have to make sure to engage focus when the bird is at the center of your frame. Personally, I don't find this useful for the 25 area mode, but if you prefer to use the old target mode, then it can make more sense because you're guiding the camera on where to start tracking. With the 25 area, I find UMD to be intelligent enough to know what to do. The second setting, CAF center priority, tells the camera to always prioritize the focus point at the center. So not just the beginning, but throughout the entire sequence. In my opinion, it is better to disable this because unless you have a lot of experience, you won't always manage to keep the bird at the center of your frame. And if it is at the edges, even momentarily, the camera will keep prioritizing the center with more chances to lose track of the bird. Then turn off CF release priority so that the camera will prioritize focus over releasing the shutter. I know that some of you may disagree with this because you'll think that prioritizing the shot is more important to not miss a moment. With other cameras, I'd say yes, keep release priority, but on the M1 series, I always see a better keeper rate with this setting turned off. Finally, we have AF limiter. This is an extension of the physical switch that you find on many telephoto lenses, including the 300mm Pro. It is entirely customizable and you can set to any minimum and maximum distance you want and the autofocus will only operate within a range. You can save up to three different settings. One way to use AF limiter is if you see that your camera is often misfocusing on the background, you can reduce the range of the maximum distance it can focus to, and that should help it avoid the mistake. This setting is interesting, but you have to make sure to set the focus distance correctly. For example, with the right cats I photograph, sometimes they fly closer to me, sometimes they're more far away. So I have to make sure that the maximum distance I set is not too short. Also, in my experience, I don't think AF limiter makes a huge difference because the number of autofocus shots you get with the M1 Mark III or the M1X is not a lot. I'll show you this later on in the video, but we're talking about less than 10% most of the time. The problem these cameras have is that they record a lot of images that are slightly soft. They look okay at first, but when you zoom in to check focus, you realize it's a bit off, and AF limiter won't help you with that. Finally, another tip I have and that I use on every camera I test is to use the back button focus. This means that instead of using the shutter release button to engage the autofocus, you use a separate button on the body. Now, the name suggests to use a button on the rear, but you can use any button you want. First, go here in the AEL AFL setting and make halfway IF inoperative. This way, pressing the shutter button won't engage focus. Then go to CAF and choose either mode 3 or mode 4. The difference between the two is how exposure lock is engaged. I use mode 4. Then go to button function, choose the button you want to use and assign the ALFL setting. And what's great about this is that if your lens has a function button, you can assign it there too. This is what I like to do with the 300mm Pro lens. I engage focus with this button here and I take picture with the shutter release button. So basically I'm working with one button for each hand and it all feels very comfortable and very balanced. The M1 Mark III has a lot of options when it comes to continuous shooting modes. And you'll see two recurrent letters in the various settings, H and L. H is for high and L is for low. H will give you the fastest speed available, which is 15 frames per second with the mechanical shutter, or 60 frames per second with the electronic shutter. L will give you 10 frames per second and 18 frames per second respectively. Now the important thing to understand is that with the H mode, the high mode, you don't have continuous autofocus. Focus is locked on the first frame. So for birds in flight, obviously you don't want high, so you need to choose one of the L modes, one of the low modes. 
To know which shutter type you're using, look at the little symbol next to each setting. L with the little heart means electronic shutter. If there is a little diamond, it is the electronic first curtain shutter, which Olympus calls anti-shock. And if there is nothing, then it is the mechanical shutter. Also note that you can change the maximum speed of the various burst modes. If for example you don't need 18 frames per second but you still want to use the electronic shutter, you can set it to 15 or 10 frames per second. By the way, the same can be done for all the H and L modes. My advice is to use the L mode with the electronic shutter, so the little heart. In my test, and this is consistent across all the recent OMD cameras, this mode gives me a better keep rate than the mechanical shutter. And if you're worrying about side effects of the electronic shutter, for example distortion which is called rolling shutter, I wouldn't worry too much because the camera has a good sensor without speed and I've never noticed anything in my images with birds in flight. Then we have another mode called Pro Capture. When you select Pro Capture and half press the shutter button or press the back button focus, the camera starts to load images in the buffer memory and you can select how many images it should load, the maximum being 35 frames and these frames are constantly refreshed while you keep the autofocus engaged. When you start taking pictures by fully pressing the shutter release button, those 35 frames are saved on the SD card. So it's like having 35 shots already there before you start taking pictures. And this is great to capture moments that are difficult to predict. And there can be many moments like that with wildlife photography. This mode uses the electronic shutter as well, and there is no change in autofocus performance or keeper rate versus the normal continuous shooting mode. The only thing that changes is the live view. If you're using the normal L mode with the electronic shutter, you get live view with blackouts. With the Pro Capture mode, you see the images that are being loaded in the buffer memory, which is not live view, so there is more delay, but because the sequence of 18 frames per second is fast enough, you can still track the bird easily. Right, I'll be quick here because these settings are the one I use with most cameras when it comes to birds in flight. So first of all, I shoot RAW, always RAW to get the best image quality, white balance to auto, I also set the ISO to auto, and in the case of OMD cameras, the maximum I use is 6400 ISO. And then when it comes to the shutter speed, I always try to stay at 1 2000th of a second or above if possible. And you can turn off the image stabilization because the shutter speed I mentioned is safe to use, so you don't really need stabilization, but there can be a reason why stabilization is useful to have activated, and that is because it gives you a preview in the viewfinder, so when you start to engage the autofocus, you also get the stabilization in DVF, which can help to compose the images. If you prefer to keep stabilization on, then my advice is to select the SIS2 mode, which only corrects for vertical shakes. This way you avoid the camera overcorrecting all your movements, which can sometimes introduce some motion blur. Then the last settings to look at concerns the viewfinder. First, choose high for the frame rate so that the live view works at 120 frames per second. Then what I like to do, and you may not agree with me on this, is to disable the exposure preview in DVF. Go in the live view boost setting and choose on one. Or alternatively, you can go here and activate the SOVF mode. The reason for this last setting is that in my experience, the light condition changes a lot when tracking a bird. And I'm not just talking about uh, the weather condition going from a sunny to cloudy situation, but also the birds moves all the time, which means that it can go from a favorable light position to a less favorable light position, like for example, against the sunlight. Another thing is that the action is really fast, so the camera won't always be able to measure the light on the bird itself, so it's going to take into account the background. For example, if the trees in the background are in the shade, the camera may overexpose, thinking that the image is too dark. This happens especially if the bird is smaller in the frame. Now, I could use a small metering mode, like spot or center weight, to only measure the center, but this doesn't always work in my opinion because the body of the bird can be in the shade, and in that case the camera may think that the image is too dark. You can use different metering modes to try to combat this, and even change the compensation of these metering settings. Personally, I just prefer to use the multi-setting and exposure compensation. But the bottom line is that the exposure can change while taking pictures, and sometimes I like to underexpose my images a little bit, one third or two thirds of a stop to preserve more highlights, and if I keep the exposure preview on in DVF, my live view might be a bit dark, or the brightness might change depending on what's happening in the scene. If I turn that setting off, the EVF has a constant brightness, and I find that easier to follow the bird in every situation.
Right, we saw a lot of settings, so let's take a break and enjoy some sample images. Quick reminder on how I evaluate the score for birds in flight. So first of all, I uh, separate the images in different folders depending on settings I used, so I can see which settings gave me the best result. And then I label the images in three different ways. Perfect sharpness, so where the focus is 100% correct. Slightly soft images, where focus is a bit off when you zoom in to check. And I would say about 90-95%. And then of course we have autofocus images and also evaluate how the camera performs when the bird is against a plain background, so the plain sky for example, or against a busy background like trees or something else. And drum rolls, the best score I got with the M1M3 is 72% and 94%. The green score includes perfectly sharp shots only, the blue score also includes slightly soft images. This is with a mix of busy and sky background. I didn't find a significant difference when the bird was against the sky or a busy background, and actually in some cases the keeper rate was worse when the bird was against the sky, which is a bit weird because you would think that a plain background which should help the camera locate the subject more easily, and this is usually what happens with other cameras. With the teleconverter the score was worse, I think partially because when the birds were flying closer it was more difficult to keep them in the frame given the extreme angle of view. So in this score there is a mix of human error and slower performance. In this case though the low burst with the mechanical shutter gave him the same result as the electronic shutter. If I go back to what I said before about the EF limiter, the problem with the A1 Mark III and other OMD cameras is not so much out of focus shots but images that are slightly soft. For example, with the French Militor Pro alone, so without the teleconverter, I took about 732 shots, and only 63 of them were out of focus, so that's approximately 9%, so it means that I had a keeper rate of 91%. However, if I include slightly soft results, then the keeper rate decreases to 70%. This problem, in my opinion, cannot be fixed with settings in camera, or at least not entirely. And this brings another thing I want to share with you guys, but first of all, let's see some more rankings. Here is the best score I got with the EM1 Mark III, then the best score I got with the X-T4, and then the A6400. Then we have the second best Nikon Z6, and finally the Sony A9 series, which is currently the best mirrorless cameras I've tested for birds in flight at the time of publishing this video. If we have a look at other OMD cameras, here is the score with the M5 Mark III, and it's more or less the same for the Olympus M1X. The EM1 Mark II is a bit lower with 66% and 81% respectively. So overall the improvement over the past 4 years is there but it's not huge. So back to the last thought I wanted to share with you guys, Olympus has added a lot of extra settings to control the autofocus behavior in the past couple of years. But what I noticed is that all the mirrorless cameras that gave me the best results for birds in flight are the cameras with the least settings to configure. For example, the Sony A7 III or the 6400, you only need to worry about two things, the focus area and the AF track sensitivity, and of course the burst speed. Same thing for the Nikon Z6. Cameras that have more settings to configure to get the autofocus right tend to have a lower score. Of course there is some exception like for example the X-T4 which has a higher score than the M1 Mark III, albeit not by a long margin. But the X-T4 is a camera you really need to configure correctly, otherwise the keeper rate can decrease a lot. Now you may say that these settings can be used for other genres or situations than just birds and I agree with you, 
But there again, with other camera system, Sony or Nikon for example, I don't need to worry about six or seven different parameters, regardless of the type of photo I'm taking. And for the record, I'm not saying Olympus made the wrong decision by adding these extra settings, but seeing how other cameras perform, I do wonder up to which point camera settings can help and up to which point it is the autofocus system and the AF algorithm that needs to be improved. Right, we arrived at the end of this video. And although the M113 doesn't give you the best performance, there are other things to like about the camera when it comes to wildlife and birds in flight. I love the ergonomics, for example. It's one of the most comfortable camera to hold, all systems combined. It has great functionalities, excellent battery life, and of course, the best image stabilizer system you can find. And of course, there is the advantage of the micro forward system when it comes to size of lenses and the system itself. Some of you may wonder how the M113 performs with the new 100-400mm lens, and the answer is very well. I tested the lens a couple of months ago and I compared it to the 100-400mm by Panasonic, and I leave the links to that full comparison in the cards or in the description below. Okay, so thank you for watching. As usual, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to leave a comment. If you like the video, please subscribe to our channel, and I hope to see you soon. Bye bye.